Johan is the pronunciation. Huh? Johan. Okay. Johan. <laughs> um, Johan is a, a professor in Indiana uh, uh, University in the School of Informatics and Cognitive Science, as you can see. Um, he, actually, he earned his Master of Science in Experimental Psychology and defended his thesis in uh, Cognitive Models of Human Hypertext Navigation in Brussels, right? And um, so his research focuses on the intersection of social media and socioeconomic phenomena. He worked with Twitter, uh, mood, with stock, uh, correlation with stock markets, and um, so for public well-being. Um, his work has led to several patents, actually, including one for usage-based in indicators to assess the impact of scholarly works and another for predicting economic trends via a network communication mood tracking. So, incredible. Um, so, in the, also, as we will, have, I think everybody here now knows, he's also a very talented DJ every weekend. Uh, we're gonna test if it's talented <laughs> tonight. Um, so, we're very lucky to have him here. So, we, we thank you, no, Johan and, uh, huh? Johan, uh, I cannot say that name, Johan, <laughs> and thank you, the floor is yours, thank you very okay. much for accepting our invitation. Okay, thank you very much. I also want to say, I, I really don't care how you pronounce my name, I really don't give a shit, <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, so I'm going to hold this to close to my mouth so you can hear. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I would say that perhaps I'm a little bit of a weird, like this, yeah, um, I, yeah, I yell. <laughs> um, so I think I'm a little bit of a weird hybrid when it comes to uh, complex systems people, because my my degree is actually in experimental psychology. I, you know, I'm actually uh, I was for a while. I think I was a certified psychologist in in my home country of Belgium, but then uh, uh, I went to work for the Los Alamos National Laboratory and became really into, well. I specialized in AI and machine learning early on, so I did a um, an apprenticeship at the uh, AI lab of Luke Steels in, in Brussels, that some of you might know. And that sort of got, but that was the, I would say the early 90s, when sort of these dreams of generative AI and large language models were very much that. They were very much dreams, you know, but I was really smitten by um, neural networks, but back then it was not cool. It was, uh, you know, AI goes through these cycles where some things are just not cool and some things are really cool and then everybody changes their minds again. Okay, so, but today I'm going to talk about something that, that has occupied me for the, you know, for the past uh, five or six years because it's socially very relevant. It's where we can actually, as scientists, do, perhaps do some good. Uh, but it's also scientifically really interesting because it relates to, to notions in, uh, uh, it, it relates to notions in complex uh, networks and complex systems, and we might be able to solve some problems that were always in the sphere of sort of clinical psychology, a lot of, sort of uh, a more qualitative modeling, and where we might be able to bring to bear some mathematical and qual quantitative modeling, if you could, uh, if you could call it that, to uh, uh, something that that I consider to be of the utmost uh, importance. So. I, I always begin with this slide because a lot of people don't fully understand the the sort of the the, the seriousness of the issue. Um, so depression is an actual disorder. You know, I mean, it's it's it it could be lethal. It is one of the leading contributors to to the burden of disability worldwide. So if you look at the worldwide statistics and you enumerate why people are not able to work, not able to socially function, uh, depression is one of those leading contributors. I think it's in the top five, if not in the top three. The lifetime uh, prevalence, uh, lifetime prevalence of, of depression as a disorder is about 16 to 17 percent. It's also very much based on um, uh, sex and gender. Uh, um, uh, uh, women actually have uh, women actually suffer from depression a lot more than men do, and if you look at the prevalence numbers, that 16% number is actually an average across both sexes or genders, and um, uh, you know the the, the the absolutely staggering numbers I think. And again, this is a serious disorder. The 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 worst is that. And this is something I'm, I'm like an old cranky guy, you know, <laughs> they always say that your happiness kind of dips around when you're 50. It's because you work so much and uh, and don't get have enough time to hang out on the beach. But the youth overall 
has always been considered to be one of the happiest constitu constituencies in any society for, for obvious reasons. And um, if you look at the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is conducted on a yearly basis, you'd see that more than, this is the United States, but th th this is probably also true for Europe, more than 40% of high school students felt so ho hopeless and sad that they could not engage in their regular activities for at least two weeks during the previous year. So that's a, you know, you could, you know, I think that that's not a, a sort of a very strong diagnostic criteria, but about two weeks of feelings like this could actually land you a diagnosis for clinical depression. And that's 40% of high school students, you know, uh, it's much worse for uh, um, uh, female students. Almost 60% of female students experience persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness during the past year, and nearly 25% made a suicide plan. So these are absolutely shocking numbers. I mean, okay, I, I, I cannot believe why we don't have like a sort of a hair on fire kind of moment. Perhaps we do uh, to look at these statistics. But the, 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 the thing is that the, the COVID-19 pandemic relative to those numbers actually worsened things, actually made things a lot worse. And um, so th this is June of 2020, you know, after the lockdowns, et cetera, things got a lot worse in terms of the uh, depression symptoms that were being reported, uh, suicide, uh, trauma or stress related disorders, et cetera. So really very bad statistics. The, the one thing that puzzles me a lot, and perhaps the, I, I don't know whether it is, the, the, this is so, sort of partially an answer to this question, but compared to, so, so the, 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 the chart starts in 19, 89. I was in college in 1989. I let me tell you that that was those were amazing years. It was really good. Uh, we had a lot of fun. 1989 actually for people who are into house music and raving is sometimes also called the summer of love. Um, and it's good. But look at these statistics. You know, if you look at the the percentage of people that ever tried cigarettes, drank alcohol, had sex, uh, um, uh, use cocaine, marijuana, etc. Have all of these percentages have plummeted over the uh, you know for our youth um, for the past uh, three decades. So you would think that that's good, um, less risky behavior. And I can assure you, in the 80s, there's a lot of risky behavior going on. That's why these statistics look like they do. But if you then look at the bottom half of the graph, you can see that you know persistently felt sad or hopeless surged seriously considered suicide those numbers have surged uh made a suicide plan those numbers have surged and again these are a little on the older side because it, it's only 20 percent right now i think we're at 36 percent uh, we're at 36 percent um attempted suicide the same thing and so the only thing that you can notice in this graph that is a little um uh, that is a little odd is that the only thing that sets young people apart in the past decade is their almost chronic social media use. Other than that, they do really well, lead very healthy lives, no less alcohol, less cocaine, uh, et cetera. But they, they've got their digital heroin, uh, it seems. And I'm not saying that that, that proves, you know, I, the, the, there's this, this joke that, you know, uh, what is it, um, uh, uh, correlation does not prove causation, but that causation is the primary cause of uh, correlation. <laughs> Well, so there's a little bit of a paradox, you know, like 82% of the US population uses social media, which is supposed to connect us to other people, uh, regardless of sort of uh, 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 geographical boundaries, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, you would think that that would make people a lot happier, simply because being because we're social, we're a social animal, we need to be connected to other people. And um, that is not what we're seeing. In fact, what we see is that social media plus all of the additional connections has led to lowered well-being. The statistics are very clear on that. I mean, in our own lab, we've done research where we actually have people report and we measure it as well, how many hours per week they spend on social media. And there's a monotonic relationship between that and, for, for example, a common screening like the PHQ-9 of uh, depressive, uh, depressive symptoms. So it's just not good. Uh, and there's, some, there's been some meta reviews as well that, that indicate that social media use is apparently really uh, um, uh, associated with anxiety and depression. So th that's a little bit of a conundrum, but I think what's going on is that these, these social networks, you know, they, if you look at Instagram for, I use Instagram, but it's only to promote my DJ business. <laughs> I don't use it for anything else, certainly not for personal stuff. Um, but these social networks, they interact through a variety of ways with, uh, a, a sort of a, a complex system 
dynamic that is shaped by our behavior, our cognition, how we think and how we feel. And unless we understand those connections a little better, we're not going to understand depression uh, and what might be involved in the surge of uh, depression and uh, the effects that social media might have on its prevalence uh, very well. And the, the one thing that I was really uh, surprised by is that if you look at depression, even though people are diagnosed with depression, that diagnosis is very much based on self-reports. Essentially, people filling out a screening of like nine or ten questions. If you had trouble sleeping, yes. You know, have you had lost uh, interest in your, your, your hobbies, yes or no? And essentially, on the basis of that screening, not, not saying that's not reliable, but it's not a very sort of strong understanding of what, what causes depression, what depression really is. In fact, um, um, the depression is actually very poorly understood. There's no established biomarkers or behavioral cognitive markers that are very reliable. So you can't take a blood test, you can't do an MRI scan or whatever. There's just nothing other than self-report through these, these screenings. But I'm in my, in my research efforts, the, the, the hope is that we can unravel some of these really complex interactions by using uh, the, the very thing that might be involved in the recent search of, 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 of internalizing disorders, as we call it, uh, by leveraging big data. Uh, the kind of data that we have right now, in terms of social media data, in terms of uh, mobile phone data, etc., literally allows us to track billions of people every second of the day for years on end. And the hope is that through those kind of, in that kind of data, we can find the traces of people's uh, social, behavioral, and cognitive and affective uh, status. And do that for millions of individuals in real time might allow us to unravel sort of the have a, a little bit of additional power in really understanding in a more quantitative sense what depression is and, and what, what shapes its occurrence. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are aware of the work done by Donny uh, Borsbaum uh, in, uh, of, uh, in, in Amsterdam, which I think is a really interesting idea. He published this paper in, in World Psychiatry in, in 2017. And when I read it, I was really floored. It's an amazing paper. And what he essentially says is that it, most disease models are kind of based on the idea that there's a disease, right? There's a, like a virus or a bacteria that makes you ill. And then there's symptoms that are caused by the underlying disorder. But that doesn't seem to be the case for depression. There's simply no biomarkers. There's no bacteria. There's no hormone levels. There's no brain scans that you could do. There's, there's almost nothing other than just people reporting symptoms. And Donny Borsbaum in, in this paper essentially proposes perhaps it's only symptoms. Perhaps there is no depression as an actual disorder. It's only symptoms. And he proposes this, this network model of mental health, where he says, well, a lot of mental health disorders do not exist in sort of a, an epistemological manner, in the, in the sense that we can say, well, there is a disease and it's causing these symptoms. It's essentially a network of sympt symptoms that can become self-reinforcing. So to give you an example, if you look at um, uh, sort of these, uh, if you look at the networks uh, that I display in this graph, um, you've got S1, S2, S3, and S4. Those nodes are symptoms, something like can't sleep or insomnia, or uh, low affect, uh, social anxiety, inability to connect with people, you know, the sort of established, established symptoms that you could find in the, in the, in the, in, in the you know, the, the uh, 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 psychiatric manuals. Anyway, so the edges between the nodes would then be whether these symptoms are reinforcing other symptoms. To give you an example, if you can't sleep at night, it might be because you're ruminating, because you're thinking, you're overthinking, right? If you can't sleep, you're going to be tired. You're going to be tired. It's going to be difficult to socialize or get the work done. As a result of that, you might worry about your job. And because you worry about your job, you can't sleep at night. So it would be a feedback loop of, of, of mutually reinforcing symptoms that can cause the individual to drop into a relatively stable equilibrium that is pathological, but where there's no underlying disease actually causing the symptoms, it's the symptoms reinforcing each other. And of course, um, since these are networks, there could be connections in these, these networks between clusters of symptoms, where one disorder as sort of an emergent pattern of, 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 of mutually reinforcing symptoms 
may reinforce other clusters. A lot of these diseases, for example, the internalized, they're called the internalizing disorders right now, are uh, highly comorbid, as we say. For example, depression and anxiety, they're, they're practically like Siamese twins. You know, if a patient has anxiety, they probably also have depression and vice versa. They're highly comorbid. Why would that be? They're distinct disorders, right? I mean, it's like catching COVID-19 and the flu at the same time. It's possible, but it wouldn't be expected. Um, so Donnie actually outlines these. I won't go into the principles one by one, but it's just based on the idea that these disorders are, are uh, 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 sort of they're disorders in the sense that they, they emerge from the complex interactions between these symptoms. So the dynamics are complex. Um, there's this idea of direct causal connections between these symptoms, where one symptom actually leads either through a behavioral, cognitive, or effective link to the other symptom. And that these mental disorders follow network structure. And there's a little bit of evidence for that as well. And so that that brought two of my other, I'm actually a fellow at the uh, University of Wageningen uh, um, uh, 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 Center, uh, led by uh, Martin Schaffer, who with uh, Ingrid van der Limpet published this paper, this paper in, in PNS in 2014. And so what they essentially proposed is, well, if that is true, if that is true about the internalizing disorder, so the, the internalizing disorder is essentially shaped by these feedback loops, these runaway feedback loops of symptoms reinforcing symptoms, then their behavior might actually exhibit what we call critical transitions. And critical transitions is where a complex system actually drops from one equilibrium very rapidly into another equilibrium that could be uh, pathological and that could have very high hysteresis. And so a graphical way of understanding that is if, if you look at the, the, the graphs on the left, you can see that, that if the system, the equilibrium state is represented by that little ball and it's right in the middle of a very deep trough in a valley. Right? That's a very stable state to be in. You can shake that system around, there's a lot of noise, but the system will always very quickly return, even when it's disturbed, to the middle of that trough, to that valley. But if the system becomes less resilient and that landscape starts to flatten out a little bit, you can have the situation in graph D where the system is still being disturbed just slightly, but at some point that disturbance will be enough to push it out of that valley and into another valley. And since the system is not likely to run uphill, you've got very high hysteresis. And that's why depression is also could be, well, this could be why depression is so difficult to treat. It's got a lot of hysteresis. It's really difficult, like an ecological web. Once you disturb it, once it drops into like a stable equilibrium, it's very, really difficult to, to get it back. Like Martin works on um, uh, ecology, for example, of lakes. Once a lake dies, it's dead. I mean, you can reintroduce the fish, the fish are going to die because there's no algae to eat. You can, you can plant some plants, but the plants are going to die because the water is turbid. You know, it's an entire, the entire ecology, ecology that kept, that kept, that kept oh, wow. Is that my voice? This is how you hear my voice? That's terrible. <laughs> Sorry. You're, you're all going to skip my DJ set now, aren't you? Uh, anyway, so the, but the idea is that these, that these mental states, if you will, that they could exhibit these these uh, these critical transitions where they very rapidly drop off a fold in that landscape, and then struggle to get back up to where they were, and uh, tantalizing enough in this paper, they show there may be um, uh, there may be uh, uh, warning signs of these kind of critical transitions, because when a system is in a stable equilibrium and the basin of attraction is really deep, and it's perturbed, it returns very quickly to where it was before because that trough is very deep. Right? And then if you, for example, look at the variance and the autocorrelation of the system over time, the autocorrelation will be very uh, low uh, because the system moves very fast back and forth and the variance will be high. I hope I said that right. Um, vice versa, if the system is exhibiting less resilient, you'll see more variance because that ball starts to sway and doesn't return as quickly to that set point as a dynamic system, right? So this is almost like a, like a sort of a, an oscillator. And uh, the autocorrelation will be uh, higher because the system stays in the same state a little longer. It's a little bit like me balancing on one leg doing yoga and my muscles are tiring out, right? And I start to, to sway and then I fall, yeah? So there's a warning signal of that transition that, that you could see in the in the uh, parameters of the system as it evolves over time.
So all of this is really tantalizing because it means that not only could it lead to a much better understanding of what depression and anxiety is, but it could actually lead to models that would allow us to predict the resilience of a system in terms of its uh, ability to withstand disturbances and not drop into one of those equilibria. That could be, by the way, be very stable, more stable than the, the well, the healthy equilibrium, right? Okay, but uh, enough of other people's work. So we've actually looked at this hypothesis uh, carefully. So here's the, Here's a graph that Ingrid van der Limpen and I did, and we didn't publish this work, frankly, because we just didn't have enough subjects to work with at the time. But the results were really tantalizing. So this is the uh, this is based on the Twitter timeline of someone suffering from bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is where people sort of switch between sort of a, a manic and a depressed state. Those switches can happen very rapidly, and they can be uh, quite detrimental to the well-being um and uh, of the individual and so we track someone's tweets over time a lot of people don't know that but the twitter api used to it's dead now thanks to elon musk if you're listening elon thank you very much um but the we could we could actually download these tweets they were timed we had the, the day and the time at which we these tweets were posted and we can do that for, for millions of individuals very rapidly, we just call the Twitter API with the user handle, and we'd get the the Twitter timeline. And so this is one of those timelines. And in those timelines, you can clearly see sort of the the indications of that individual transitioning from a, a, a more active to a more passive, more depressed state. But not only that, we see the same thing in the sentiment and the effective state of the individual. And so that's a really interesting because that means we can actually start to test these hypotheses which were untestable before by virtue of having this kind of big data available to us. So we did we ran this for a whole bunch of timelines but just a couple of hundred which is not enough to really work with. And we also pointed out to one particular problem. So th these are not bipolar uh, individuals, these are individuals that that uh, suffer from the uh, depression. And you can clearly see, if you, so these tweets were rated using a sentiment analysis tool that looked at valen, uh, valence of the tweets, or how happy or sad it is, how uh, the arousal and the dominance. So it's the, the effective norms for English words that we used in this case. So you end up with a three-dimensional um, uh, sort of a state vector for the individual based on their tweets. And you can clearly see that in these, in these timelines, there's particular points in which the parameters of that timeline do seem to change. For example, on, on the right, you can clearly see sort of a, a, a it's sort of a punctuate, sort of a point where the 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 timeline starts to uh, 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 decelerate. So that the the autocorrelation seems to become higher. Um, I don't know whether you can see it, or perhaps you, you disagree with what I'm uh, trying to see here. But we found some indication that this is the case. The only problem is we don't know when these transitions happen because people are not going to go necessarily on Twitter to tell us, hey, Johan, guess what? I just had one of those critical transitions that you published a paper in PNAS about. We won't know. And then it's really, then it becomes difficult to determine whether what you're observing in these time series actually corresponds to something real. Yeah. I um, mean, yeah. Okay, so I forgot there was an, actually an animation that showed the uh, the changes in the time series as we observed them. So I'm going to talk about sort of two specific things, hopefully, which will hopefully be of interest to you, um, where we're trying to sort of look, model the dynamics of human emotions at much finer temporal resolution than was possible before. Usually, as a psychologist, the way that you measure someone's emotion is by asking people. Because emotions are not very real either. It's hard to say, but it's, I mean, there's, there's, there's very little in the way of biophysical measurements that you can use to show that somebody is happy or sad or disappointed, et cetera. This is what they tell you, but that's actually really difficult to observe by, in, from biophysical measurements. So a lot of, so if you're measuring human emotions, very often that's through introspective self-reports. It's just relying on people telling you how they feel. Now that leads to all kinds of bias, like experimenter bias. I mean, you put, put someone in a lab and then you ask them how they're feeling. Obviously, they're going to be surrounded by people in white lab coats. You know, the, the, the calls into question the, that calls into question the, um, uh, the validity of that report. 
Uh, there's also social conformity bias. Very often people will not tell you how they feel because they're ashamed of how they feel or they, 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 they just won't tell somebody else. So social conformity bias, or they, they will tell you, like for example, in some cultures, it's like Americans will never tell you that they're feeling horrible. They're always feeling great. They don't mean it literally. That's just what you say. It's like a greeting. Yeah, everybody's great. That's it. You know. So there's social conformity. There's a the social expectation that, that you tell people that it's great. Um, it's also really difficult to norm because if you ask someone how they feel, you, 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 I mean, in principle, you should compare that to how they were feeling before, right? So you have to ask them repeatedly. But if you do that, of course, then you've got within subjects interaction of your measurements, which is also uh, uh, troublesome. So the, the only other thing available is physical measurements. That's where they measure your skin conductance or look at your the, your, the muscles in your uh, muscles in your face, etc. But that is also really tough to do because well, those are physical responses, but they don't they don't correlate very well with subjective states. So you can't do that either. So what we did in this uh, uh, research is that we we looked at naturally occurring emotions and we looked at online self reports. So what do we mean by that? So online self reports were let's see what it is. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to show you the diagram. Um, so we looked at people that went on Twitter and literally using those literal words said, I feel followed by an adjective or an adverb. I feel great. I feel terrible. Yeah. And so depending on the valence of the word that followed the statement, I feel, we deemed that, we deemed that person to be experiencing either a positive or a negative emotion. So if someone said, I, I feel horrible, then we concluded that was negative. We had a limited set of objectives that we used that were very uh, clear. So if someone says, I feel slightly despondent, that was not excluded. That was excluded. We only looked at, uh, I think, four or five um, sort of uh, very, very explicit indications of someone's mood. So I feel plus my. So if someone posts a tweet like that, we have the time at which they submit that tweet. And so we presume that is also the time at which they are, in fact, experiencing the emotion. Right? So we call that T0. And then, of course, because we have timelines for all of these individuals, we look at the tweets that they posted before and after T0. So if someone posted another tweet five minutes before a tweet in which they reported saying, I feel terrible, then we subject that tweet to sentiment analysis to give us an indication of how that person was feeling before they reported explicitly that they were having that emotion. And of course, we did that for the tweets after. And so if we group those tweets at fixed intervals before T is zero, that means for, for groups of people, but also for individuals, we, we were able to track how their, the underlying emotion that we know occurred because they told us evolves in the valence of their tweets. And since we have lots and lots of tweets and pe people tweet almost on a uh, you know on an hourly basis some people tweet every minute uh, that gives us some very high resolution measurements so just to give you an, an idea of the scale that you can apply to this kind of research so we took 700 the time limits of 710 uh, a thousand randomly chosen Twitter users. And so then we looked at what we call sort of an, uh, uh, um, instances of affect labeling, where people labeled their affective state by saying, I feel horrible. So we know they're feeling horrible. We know when that happened. And that can only mean one thing, they're having a negative emotion, right? So we looked at um, the positive adverbs are good, happy, great, and awesome. And there was bad, unhappy, sad, terrible, horrible, and awful. Why did we choose those adverbs? Because we wanted to. We just figured that that was a good enough sample, very clear and, uh, and explicit. Our idea is not to capture the full spectrum of all possible emotions that somebody could experience as the, the most individual expression of their, their most individual uh, emotion. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at sort of very clear examples of someone explicitly labeling their affective state. And so if you look at all of those, apparently this is quite common on Twitter. We had about 110,000 individuals, positive 42,000, negative 67,000, which, which is kind of telling. Apparently people go are more likely to report a negative emotion on Twitter than a positive emotion. Um, okay, so again, to summarize this, at T0, we have the affect labeling, and then we looked at tweets that were posted up to six hours before T0 and up to six hours after. Yeah? And every single tweet that was posted within those 12 hours was subjected to uh, the Vader sentiment analysis engine that I'm pretty, pretty fond of, honestly. Uses a lexicon, which means you know exactly where the rating came from. Uh, the, the, the lexicon has been very well vetted. 
It's also been show, shown in service to be quite accurate. Sure, yes, could we use some super, super duper sort of a, a, a Burke transformer neural network? Yes, but it, it's, data is actually difficult to beat. And it is auditable in the sense that you know why sentiment rating was produced. So anyway, we did that for every single one of the tweets. Usually people ask, did you include retweets? No, we didn't. Um, we also excluded individuals that had more than nine, that had more affect labeling than 95% of the subject in the sample. So if someone said, I feel something, something a lot, or more than 95% of the individuals in our sample, they were excluded. Uh, we also excluded tweets that were posted on unusual days where we had a lot of I feel statements. For example, let's just say it's Christmas and everybody sees that I feel, I feel like uh, unpacking presents or something like that, then that day was excluded. Uh, we also excluded affect labeling tweets without an objective. So it says, I, I am like excluded. Um, uh, users without time zone information, we were worried that the date and time time might not be reliable. So we removed those as well. And then we excluded cases where the same individual had more than one affect labeling in the same 48 hours to prevent that would have overlapping emotions. Yeah. You know, my, my daughter always says that I only have two emotions, which is hungry and angry, and that they can overlap. So it's like a two-dimensional model of my emotion, but but I, I think she's not do, doing justice to the very rich palette of emotions that I experience as a human being. Um, anyway, so the these are the results of this analysis that you can see. And again, this is at the minute scale. For you know, roughly 100,000 uh, Twitter users. And what you can see is, of course, there's a lot of variance there. There's a lot of noise. But if you look at the 95% confidence interval of the 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 uh, positive ratings of these tweets, you can see that they're in a pretty narrow band, and you can see that at time zero, at zero hours, you can see a clear spike of these tweets becoming more positive before someone actually went on Twitter and said, "I feel great" or "I feel good," meaning that even though their tweets weren't about having a feeling their valence was already changing as a result of the underlying emotion that happened at T0. Does that make sense? And so what we see, though, is that when you say that you feel good, your emotions immediately tune down to the baseline. So that could be, a, that's a known effect of affect labeling. Affect labeling really helps to downregulate emotions. So if you have a feeling and you tell somebody that you're having that feeling in as few words as possible, it downregulates the emotion very quickly. I think it's a, as a result of seriously your prefrontal cortex getting involved with the amygdala. There's actually a feedback loop going on there. Anyway, so for the negative emotions, the news is even better because as you can see, if you see the graph on the right, you could see those negative emotions sort of accelerating towards a point in time where the user seems to become aware, the individual becomes aware of the emotion and says, I feel terrible. But as soon as they do, as you can see, that emotion shoots back up to the baseline and it's gone. And this is very good news because it means that negative emotions are very short-lived, at least on Twitter. So if you're having a bad day or you're not feeling great, just tell somebody you're not feeling great and within five minutes, you should be okay according to these statistics. I don't know whether that's good advice to give people, but okay. But that's what the data shows. Um, I'm very proud of this paper. I also want to stress again that the emotional expression itself at T0 was excluded from this analysis. So we're not looking at tweets that are about people's emotions. We're looking at tweets that were posted before and after someone actually declared an emotion. But the actual declarative statement was not included. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, the nice thing about it is now we can bring some quantitative modeling to bear on this. So we actually uh, found that these these curves are best fitted with exponential functions, we, which is interesting because that indicates that there's a little bit of sort of an escalation, like a feedback loop going on uh, with these emotions until they become consciously aware to the individual, they express it and then downregulate the emotion as they become aware of it. But you can clearly see in the case of positive valence and negative valence, that these these curves indicate sort of a very quick acceleration of the emotion and the valence of these tweets, which is then punctuated by the self-report and then uh, sort of a, a return to the baseline. Now, the, the one thing I wanted to talk, I mean, perhaps I'm running out of, tell me, if are you, is this of interest to you guys? I see a lot of your faces have become very, are you bored? Yes? Oh, okay. 
Okay, I could spice this up a little bit. Okay, give me a few minutes, okay, and there will be some more spicy stuff. Okay, so the, of course, we could do this. If we can do this for individuals, we can also do it for collectors. We can do this for large groups of people because I, I think there is such a thing as collective emotions. Each of us individually makes an interpretation of our own effective state, which we can report to other people. But as we start to talk about how we all feel, then something like a collective emotion could observe. And we've actually done this during the pandemic where we looked at um, uh, sort of uh, tweets that were posted by individuals that mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic. So we figured that if someone talks about the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we're not using those tweets, but we downloaded their timelines and then we analyzed the tweets that were not about the COVID-19 pandemic to get a sense of how the COVID-19 pandemic affected these individuals' effective state over time. That also points out a really interesting methodological issue that I've seen a lot. So take a bunch of tweets and the tweets say depression, right? And then you analyze those tweets where it's people talking about the topic of depression, but you're not measuring anything about the individual that is talking about depression. You're just measuring what the topic of what they're, what, the text that they're generating. And so what we did here is for, um, for 20 US cities, we created a cohort of individuals that 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 mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic, indicating that they were affected or or, or aware of it. I, I doubt that anybody wouldn't be aware of it, but fine. And then and then tracked their timelines such that we had a stable cohort that we could track over time for each of these U.S. cities. And what we found is that if you would have just done a sentiment analysis of the COVID-19 tweets themselves, you would have concluded that Americans got a lot happier across 20 U.S. cities as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it shows you how this data can fool you. The reason for that being is that as the pandemic got worse and worse and the lockdowns got started, et cetera, people started to boost each other's sentiment online. Come on, we can do this, you know, let, let's beat the virus, et cetera. And the tweets became more positive. Well, the tweets about COVID-19. But if you actually looked at the sentiment of the individuals in these, in these, um, uh, uh, in these cities, as assessed from the actual user timeline data, you could see that uh, that sentiment plummet. And so collectively, we were all a lot less happy during the pandemic than we seem to be from the tweets that we posted about the COVID-19 pandemic. It's kind of funny how people hide their, their, their feelings, but they're still measurable by relying on this kind of data. In fact, we, we looked at sort of um, the, the collective sentiment of communities that were hit by hurricanes to measure what we call collective resilience. You know, some, city, some cities, they get hit by natural disasters and never recover. They never recover because people leave, you know, everybody kind of gives, gives up on the place. And we were trying to find out. We didn't have a lot of, most of these cities bounced back beautifully. Uh, but, I mean, this is the United States. I mean, it's pretty, these are relatively rich states. You would expect people there to be quite resilient. Okay, so the last thing I just wanted to talk about before I've, I've completely bored you to death, but this is something that I've been really interested in over the past couple of years. It's sort of this idea of um, uh, cognitive indicators, and the, the, especially because it relates to language. I think language has really had its moment right now. If you look at AI and machine learning, the the big advance, adv advances that we've seen have been in large language models over the past three or four years. If you look, for example, at something like ChatGPT, et cetera, I, I, I guarantee you nobody could have predicted 20 years ago that we would have something so close to sort of general intelligence, artificial general intelligence, as what ChatGPT and a bunch of these large language models seem to be able to simulate. But just from modeling language at very large scales with lots and lots of parameters. So that's been a little bit short. But there's, there's a notion in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the gold standard for the treatment of depression and anxiety, is one of the few, well, not the few, but one of the most effective treatments that you could receive for uh, depression. And one of the tenets is that people who um, uh, are depressed exhibit what we call distorted modes of thinking. And uh, all of us have, have those kind of thoughts, but people who suffer from depression and anxiety have a lot of them. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, have you ever, I'm sure you've ever heard a friend say something like, I'm not gonna go to the party because none of my friends want me to be there. Nobody likes me, so why should I go or perhaps you've never heard that good, but your friends are in good shape. But, but these are very common things to hear from people who are depressed. Right? And we know that's not true because they wouldn't be your friends if they hated you. right? Or I'm not gonna participate in the exam, I'm gonna fail anyway, but okay, now you can read the future apparently. You know exactly what's gonna happen tomorrow and that you will fail the exam. 
right? So that's called future telling. So cognitive behavioral therapy is based on this idea that there's a feedback loop between your, your uh, behavior, your thoughts, and your feelings that is self-reinforcing. And remember, I started this talk referring to Donnie Bosbaum, sort of network model of symptoms. This is very much aligned with that kind of thinking. Namely, that for, to give you an idea, for example, someone tell, I'm not going to go to the party because I'm not feeling well. And if I'm not feeling well, I go to the party, I am convinced I will have a bad time. And so then you don't go to the party, which means you don't see your friends, but you might see all of the really cool photos that they're posting on on Instagram about how they're such great friends and how they're having such a great time. And that might make you think like they're having more fun without me exactly as I predicted. And that's gonna make you feel sad. And so next time there's a party, you're gonna think like, I, I, I don't feel well, I'm not gonna go to Anyway, so you have the perfect feedback loop bec between your thoughts, your feelings and your behavior. And this is effectively with cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy addre addresses. That's why it's called cognitive behavioral therapy. But one of the tenets is that cognitively speaking, people who suffer from depression exhibit these distorted modes of thinking. And well, of course, how do you measure those? Well, we've got, we've got a little bit in our toolkit uh, for measuring uh, people's feelings and thoughts. Feelings, yes, we can do uh, natural language processing on their tweets, but thoughts, that's a little different. How do you measure someone's thoughts, right? Is a thought real? Where is it? Can we measure it? Doubtful. I think thinking and language are much cl more closely aligned than we thought. It's, I, I, I call it Skinner's revenge, okay? So cry your heart out, Chomsky. I can't say I, I can't believe I said this in public. I'm probably going to be excommunicated as I return to the cognitive science department at IU. Anyway, the if you look at the sort of generally psychologists when they talk about cognitive distortions, they recognize a number of sort of categories. That doesn't mean they're real. It's just to illustrate the concept. So to give you an idea, for example, a typical one that I've seen a lot is labeling and mislabeling. So all of these are examples really of sort of um, shortcuts in thinking dichotomized thinking. Like for example, I'm a total loser. Yes, I mean, it's possible, but very unlikely that someone is completely, utterly a total loser. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, right? That's the normal way of looking at it. Well, normal, that's how a lot of people look at it. But when you hear someone say, I'm a total loser, that's obviously not good. Right? But it's a, a case of labeling, labeling and mislabeling. You, you, you can't be a total loser. Yeah, everybody wins sometime, sometimes. Uh, another thing is that uh, the column is reasoning. No one will ever like me. It's typical, and, and again, this sounds ridiculous to people who, are, sort of, who don't suffer from this kind of thinking. But I, I assure you that the, the therapists that I talk to have lots of patients that come to their, their clinic and that it exhibit exactly these kind of thought patterns. Um, no one will ever lo love me. Well, it's the economy's reasoning. Nobody ever? Surely someone will like you. It's, uh, I mean, uh, you know, the evening will be a disaster. That's catastrophizing. It may be a little mid, maybe a little meh, but a, a disaster? I mean, what would that mean? The building collapses? Right? So all of these are sort of really unrealistic, overly negative thoughts about oneself one's social environment and and the world and very often they're combined for example everybody believes i'm a failure called that's called mind reading it means that you can read other people's thought you know that they think that you're a failure which is also dichotomized reasoning and mislabeling so very often these are packed together in statements and so what we did is we we figured okay well very often this is Again, like with the COVID-19 data, this is topically related. So you look at tweets about COVID-19, and then you think you're measuring something about how people feel during the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's the opposite. So here we were looking at ways of measuring these patterns of thinking in language, but in sort of a context-free manner. And so what we did is we put a, a, a lexicon together, and this was uh, based on the experiences of the, the clinical psychologist in, 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 I'm not a clinical psychologist in our team. And so we did is we, we um, sort of invented this idea of cognitive distortion schemata. And these are essentially context-free, minimal 
um, lexical semantic building blocks of distorted thinking. For example, fortune telling, which I just mentioned, very often when people um, exhibit uh, fortune telling, they will say something, I will never, you will never, we will never, we will always, right? So these little bits and pieces, that three gram is very often associated with, with the cognitive distortion of the fortune telling kind. Um, labeling and mislabeling, it's very difficult to label yourself something without saying I am A. So that three gram I am A is very often indicative that someone is expressing a labeling or mislabeling. Mind reading, the same thing. Everybody thinks, uh, still feels emotional reasoning. Sure, I passed the exam, but it still feels like I failed. Right. So this still feels as indicative. So we had uh, 241 of those engrams, which were fed it by a team of uh, cognitive behavioral therapists, and that we can then use as a lexicon to do sentiment and uh, um, uh, to do natural language processing on the tweets that we observed to see whether we could actually detect, detect these modes of thinking. So catastrophizing, will fail, will go wrong, will end, will be impossible. It's not complete. We're not looking for high recall, but we are looking for high precision in a context-free manner. So we're, we're not interested in why you think you will fail. We're interested in that you said will fail, because that, that's a fortune, uh, catastrophizing and also fortune telling. Uh, um, and so then, of course, you know, since we have all of this Twitter data lying around, uh, the hypothesis is this, do depressed individ individuals really exhibit higher levels of language indicative of distorted thinking? Empirically speaking, that had not been demonstrated. So most Therapists know this, they know this from experience, but it has never been quantitatively demonstrated apparently in language. And so the idea is as follows. Okay, cognitive behavioral therapy hypothesizes that these cognitive distortions are quite powerful in the language of uh, people with depression. And so we looked, we looked for people that had depression and were on Twitter. So we harvested all of their data. And then we had a control group, a random control group of people that didn't have depression, and we downloaded all of their Twitter timelines. And then we, we would look for the, uh, uh, the prevalence of these cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive distortion uh, schemata in our data. Oops, sorry. It's kind of difficult to find people that are depressed on Twitter that you, well, that's not, not difficult. There's lots of, <laughs> but, but you have to know, right? You have to actually explicitly know. And so what we did is we, we looked for people that said on Twitter, I was diagnosed with depression, literally. Nothing else, or hi, I have been diagnosed. Yes. I was just, I'll show you. Yeah. Uh, oh, you mean, you mean uh, depression? It's, it, it happens a lot. Yes. Now, it, we're talking about 12,007 individuals here, but, but I, I will tell you that this is a, a relatively small sample that we had where we looked for a, a couple of months. So people do, I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, people post their prescription notes on Twitter. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's like, they don't know it's a public forum or th there's no stigma whatsoever associated. Uh, no, people are very active in posting this and people go like, listen, guys, you know, I haven't been tweeting for a while. I know that you've look, been, been looking for updates, but, <clears throat> but I got to tell you, I went to the doctor, doctor says I've got depression. It happens all the time. So that was not too difficult to find. Let's see the date range here. It's May to September, 2018. And then, of course, you need to remove a lot of individuals from that data. So that's why we ended up with a sample of 1,207. Each of these individuals, one of our therapists and clinical psychologists went to look at their account and try to gauge whether that was really a person, whether that was not a commercial account, and whether they were sincere in their statement and whether that statement was really indicative of them having received, well, not self-diagnosing, but actually getting a, a, a diagnosis from an actual doctor. Yeah, it's a good question, but yeah, it happens all the time. And then we have a random sample of people that did not do that and did not mention depression at all, et cetera. Okay. And here are the results. And actually the results are pretty shocking. I think the sort of at the, at the cohort level, at the cohort level, we can see that the uh, between cohort level, it's about 20% more prevalent, which is a good, a sizable effect. Again, this is just tweets. 
that are not about depression, that have not been filtered for sentiment, for none of the other markers of there's just people saying I was diagnosed with uh, with uh, a depression, and you can see they have a much higher prevalence of these kind of cognitive distortion markers in the language, which is a quantitative demonstration of a principle that cognitive behavioral therapy has um, uh, uh, has assumed for 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 quite a while. Which cognitive distortion types are more prevalent? And we can look at that as well. We can see that, for example, personalizing, emotional reasoning, overgeneralizing, mental fill. I mean, honestly, you can take those cognitive distortions, come out and start writing tweets. That's how prevalent these are. A lot of tweets contain these cognitive distortion markers. They're very prevalent, which also tells us something about how online language might be depressogenic by promoting the kind of language that is associated with depression. And of course, if, it, if that were the case, we're in big trouble. Because a good chunk of humanity is on social media almost continuously, 24-7. I was particularly struck by personalizing and emotional reasoning. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention this. So personalizing and emotional reasoning is two and a half times more prevalent. So not 20%, but two and a half Two and a half times more prevalent. Okay, I'm sorry. You're, you, you've made that gesture several times and it's because, I, okay, I'm sorry. I just don't like my voice to boom like that. Okay, um, so the other thing is a lot of people have already using classifiers, et cetera, demonstrated that people who have depression say I a lot more, they're much more self-reflective. Um, and so we, we did the analysis again, but we removed uh, we removed all tweets that, that contain personal pronouns from the data. We also uh, checked whether those cognitive distortion schemata uh, had uh, valence loadings. They didn't, on average, at least not. And so that cannot be an explanation. So it's really cognitive. It's a cognitive uh, problem. So right now we're running this for individuals at very large scales to see whether we can see the development of cognitive distortions in the minds of people that are getting a little but My theory is that it reduces the resilience of individuals, emotional resilience. So once you start to think like this, it reduces your emotional resilience and it makes these kind of um, uh, critical transitions more likely. It's a really interesting hypothesis, I think. Um, because again, the, the symptoms associated with depression are very often cognitive. It's it's what happens in people people's minds. They're otherwise perfectly healthy. Um, but here's something I, I'm going to stop here because I've been talking for too long. Uh, but here's something I did that, that scared the bejeebus out of me when I did this analysis because this okay. So we can think okay, well I'm not depressed, so I'm good. No. I, I understand Twitter and all of that. I'm not on Twitter, so it doesn't affect me. I'm good, you know. Okay, I understand that it's a very American way of thinking, but you're good, so fine. So keep it that way. However, we ran the same analysis that I just showed you, but not for a sample of depressed people on Twitter and not depressed people on Twitter, but we ran it for Google Books. Most of you know about Google Books, I presume. So Google effectively scanned, I know, 10% of the world's literature, which is one of the biggest digitized collections of books available. And what we did, and it's you know they started scanning books. Well, they, no, they didn't start in the 16th century. But the, the the first books that they scanned were published in the year 15 something, and it goes all all the way to to the present. And so what we did is we for for uh, uh, well we had the cognitive distortions come out of for English, but we translated into Spanish because several of the co-authors of this paper are actually native Spanish speakers. I'm not. Uh, and then we translated them to German. I do speak German, and uh, so does another, not natively, but we, we did have a native German speaker on the team as well. And we translated all of them to German uh, as well. And so that allowed us to test this across very sort of separate linguistic domains. I mean, the Germ uh, 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 German is a beautiful language, but it's mostly spoken in, in, in Germany and in Austria and Switzerland, and not so much as a second language in the rest of the world. Uh, Spanish, also a beautiful language, but it's spoken in Europe, it's spoken in the, the whole of Latin America, so you've got a very broad geographical area. And then you've got English, which is spoken almost everywhere, but here we focused on U.S. English specific. So these are books that are published in the U.S. And so what we did is we, for every year, we took the books that were published in that year and we measured the prevalence of cognitive distortions. And I want to point out one, th the first thing I want to point out is, uh, let's see, German is, is uh, green. Can you see a point in history where the expression of cognitive distortions was very high? 
Do you recognize the date range? Do you want a mic? Because it's difficult to hear. Now I'm having difficult. I'm having difficulty hearing you. I'm sorry. So I'm getting a dose of my own. Uh, yeah. So just uh, and a question. When I see this graph, I mean, uh, so imagine that publishing of the books, for example, in German, increase over the time, especially during the World War II. Okay, yeah. but uh, this is normalized by volume. That's a prevalence. So if you, if you look at it, it's 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 a prevalence. It's not it's not a frequency. Because I would agree with you. Yes, of course. Yeah, more books. But, but, yeah. Okay, but. Uh, I mean, depends also by geographical position because extend more than uh, so the people that speak German that most during that period. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, the, the, this is so this is normalized by the amount of books published, by the amount of words published, really, and so that means that the it's the percentage of the total language in German that that match the cognitive distortions come out of, like we defined it went up in the language uh, the other thing i wanted to point out is that this is a, if you look at the y-axis this is a z-score so we took every single one of those cognitive distortions come out of, is an n-gram a one two three four or five gram and five grams of course are much rare much more unique than a one or two gram and so what we did is we every single one of those individual cognitive distortion time series was mean centered and then normalized by the standard deviation over that period. So they were converted to z-scores. So what you see here is actually a bootstrapped confidence interval based on the z-scores of those cognitive distortions uh, on a, on a, uh, at a yearly re resolution. So it simply means that of the books published in German, taking into account the total volume, you had a, a huge spike of cognitive distortion starting around 19, 1940 and then peaking in 1946 when the war kind of ended although there's i mean there's, there's some horrible books you can read about how things got in the years after the war so it was not a, a sort of a necessarily a happy uh liberation you know um but so okay that's 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 germany but there, there there's also quite some works published about sort of language of fascism think think of how fascists talk they are they will always be we will never every time we that sounds a lot like these cognitive distortions i was mentioning so the register of fascism might have left its traces in german literature and and was detected by a te technique that we use to detect cognitive distortions which are characteristic for people suffering from mental health disorders okay that said and you notice this, of course, you know, there's the, I, you know, I try to kind of ignore it and focus your attention on what happened sort of with the, in the. Sorry, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Uh, maybe the red Turn the mic off. Okay. So. Just play the music. That's how I know it's over. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, my question is, you're looking at the number of uh, words published, right? H how do we adjust for the importance of the book? So maybe just, there was just one crazy person writing 1,000 books? Yeah. OK. Yeah. I mean, it's possible. Mm. But I will say this, though, most people don't publish 1,000 books. It's a, it's like scientists, you know. Sometimes they see people's resumes, and you know they've published eight hundred papers. Come on, nobody publishes eight hundred papers. I mean, it's, yeah, I I agree with you. Yes, there could be authors that are very uh, productive, and they would be in relative terms overrepresented. But we're talking about uh, one hundred and twenty-five years of books. This is ten percent of the the. I mean, the, the amount of the, the volume of books published is enormous. And just uh, also the, 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 these um, uh, this data is bootstrapped to account for uh, that kind of variance in the sample. I should also mention that we we have if you see the gray line that's a null model, and that's where we took like random n-grams and uh, determined whether they um, th for that year matched th the cognitive distortions. 
And so that way we kind of, it's, it's a null model that essentially accounts for changes in publishing volume. The, the, uh, kind of, there was actually quite a bit of criticism on this paper on Twitter for people who didn't understand the meaning of a null model. But that null model was based on the same data. And uh, if there were changes in the underlying collection, collect, if there were changes in the underlying collection, you'd see it in the null model as well. And you do see some changes in that null model that might be tied to, to, to different publishing practices, et cetera. But if we account for those with the null model, if we sort of uh, de -bias it with the null model, you can still very clearly see, and this is the main effect that we showed. And so this is, again, something I want to point out. So 1980s were super good. I think we've established this also. The music was amazing. Come on. The styles are awesome. Ital Disco ruled. And then look what happened. So in English, we've, we've seen like a, a decline of cognitive distortions in the English language for almost a century. And then in the 1980s, things started to turn. You could see them accelerate up past the 2000s. And then when the 2000s hit, 2007 is when the iPhone was launched. You see a further acceleration. And then a little bit of a plateau, but that could be the result of um, sort of less books having been scanned in recent years because it takes a while for them to be scanned. So that's not very reliable necessarily. But we see the same happen for um, uh, German uh, as well as Spanish. So that means this is a worldwide phenomenon where our languages, the world's population, the, well, perhaps not the world's population, but at least for these very large language groups, you can see there's been persistent changes in the language that are associated with lexical patterns that characterize people that suffer from depression and anxiety. I, I, I don't know what to tell you, but, but I, I find these results uh, quite scare, scary. We published another paper based on the same data where instead of looking for a lexicon of cognitive distortions, we did a, a random principal component analysis of the data. And there we found that this a similar pattern and a search took place but especially for the where you could see the language of rationality, like things like institutions, schools, infrastructure, et cetera, was uh, increasingly took a backseat to language related to intuition, like I feel, I think, you know, which is also kind of overlapping with this notion of internalizing disorders, because that's what internalizing disorders are. But we find a similar effect, a similar surge away from the language of rationality towards a language of intuition and personal experiences over the past 20 years so i don't know what's happening in the world but uh, it's it's not a, this is not very encouraging <laughs> sorry <laughs> um, anyway so perhaps i should stop here because i've been talking for about an hour sorry we have a, a question from an on online participant uh georgina you want to unmute and ask your question please uh, of course oh thank you um, sorry, well, um, thank you so much for the great talk. Um, my question is, uh, can cognitive distortions be inherited from parents to children? I'm sorry, what was it? I didn't quite understand. Uh, what is that? Oh, can they be communicated from parents to children? Um, yeah, I mean, we're doing quite a bit of research on uh, 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 um, to determine whether they're communicable. And we're running a research project right now where we're actually testing whether language is more likely to be to be diffused in social networks, depending on whether they contain cognitive distortions or not. If that if that's the case, and I, I think that, that that I mean, in this case, it would be within the family, right? But it could also be within friend groups and social networks, etc. But if that is the case, so let's just say for on social media that these, these cognitive distortions are usually sort of, the, it's dichotomizing language. Never, always, everybody, nobody, etc. Well, that's language that draws attention because it's dichotomized. And social media thrives on attention, on engagement. And so if these posts are more engaging or they, they, they capture more of our attention, it's possible that they become more prevalent. And if they become more prevalent, then that might change slightly how we think about ourselves how we talk about ourselves and about others, and you'd have one big sort of depression machine that about sort of half of humanity logs into on a daily basis. And yeah. Yes. Thank you. So it's possible. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you for the question, by the way. That was uh, yeah, that would be a wonderful research project. So pl please send me an email, and I'd be super interested in in looking at this because it, it, these are a lot of behaviors is, is learned, and it's possible. I mean, that's my hypothesis. I'm not saying this is actually true, but it's possible the these algorithms on social media that promote engagement, as you say, might have the side effect of promoting content that is engaging. And that just in some cases happens to be replete with these cognitive distortions that are not good for us. Yeah, they might be amplified. Lots of things are amplified. And moralistic language is, for example, also amplified by these algorithms. There's actually quite a bit of research showing that tweets that can, that contain um, uh, words with high moral loadings are more more frequently retweeted. They diffuse better online. And so it could be possible that this is the case for cognitive distortions as well. And again, we might have a little bit of a problem on our hand. So yeah, I think it's a very important question. Thanks for the talk. I have a lot of questions, but I would first start with an observation slash question. So uh, at the very beginning, you presented this hypothesis that increased mental health problems are related to social media use and then later you show this network of symptoms but i'm wondering whether this increased social media use can be seen as a symptom by itself because this is something that i observed in myself so i don't really use like facebook instagram and so on but in times in life when I'm more down, I'm much more prone to staring at a screen, to using these like passive forms of entertainment, which are kind of dissociative. So, yeah, exactly the doom scroll. So I'm wondering if you considered or if you consider worth considering in research treating this as a separate symptom. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, it would be very difficult to to, to disconfound cause and effect in this case. I mean, that's pro that's the problem with a lot of these network models because they're essentially saying, well, got all of these symptoms, and this, the assumption that the symptom is a thing, right? That we can measure it, we can observe it, and now there's like a node in the network, and that we can measure their their causative relations, right? Because one has to reinforce the other. But it's obvious not all of these symptoms are at the same sort of epistemological level. You know, some symptoms are very broad, some, some are more specific. And when these symptoms, these symptoms started, this is what um, uh, it's called, what the old cyberneticians called circular causality. It's what the old cyberneticians called circular causality, namely that when A causes B and B causes A, then time no longer has any meaning. You can look at the system at any point in time, but you will not know whether A is the causative agent or B is the causative agent, which started. For, it's sort of a chicken and egg problem, yeah, but, uh, but, but more fancifully expressed. And so in this case, I think that would be really tough to disambiguate. However, there's, I mean, I, I've been really fascinated with sort of this notion of convergent cross mapping, which allows you to look at uh, different time series and determine whether there's indications of cause, uh, causal um, influence of of, of the um, the uh, the factor measured in one time series versus the other, and so what you could do, if if we could if, if we were all all knowing, if we could monitor your your effective state, and we could monitor all of your social media use, we'd have like these two times we'd have these two two time series, and then we might be able to do sort of convergent cross mapping to determine the the pos the possibility of a, a causal relationship between the two or a mutually reinforcing relationship. But yeah, people are effectively working on these kind of things. So I kind of did that on myself. It's not really strict or quantitative, but I do journal regularly, and I have noticed these patterns that very often it's actually the effective state that comes first and then the doom scrolling of course once the doom scrolling starts then it takes extra effort to get out of that yeah, exactly. but i do i do think this is something that's very interesting and one other comment that i have is that i'm wondering how much of these symptoms are truly pathological and what does it mean that something is an illness or a disability what if they are actually very normal although that's a loaded word but let's say very human responses to things that are happening yeah that's the that's the idea of the, that's the idea of depressive realism right if things suck you know it's it's not abnormal if you can use that word for you to feel bad about it you know but the i think it's perfectly possible for these for the symptoms to be normal but the depression to be in the dynamic 
the dynamics of these symptoms reinforcing each other. Everybody worries, you know, every, I mean, I worry from time to time, you know, and sometimes I'm up at, li- at night thinking, oh my God, I should have submitted, I'm going to miss the deadline, you know, something like that. That That is probably normal. That's part of life. It's when these symptoms start to, so the depression is not in the symptoms. It's in the, the, the emerge, it's an emergent pattern of these reinforcing symptoms. They, Well, it's a little bit like a like a flock of birds, you know. I mean, the birds have their own sort of behavioral model, and they they you know they align their they align their 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 state vectors and how they move, etc. But that's not the flock. The flock that we see is the result, the emergent an emergent property of those interactions. And so I think that that could be the case. I think that it's it. I mean, it hasn't been proven, but I think that's a very interesting hypothesis to to, to explain why, for example, with depression, we haven't found any biomarkers. The only diagnostics we have is just asking people if you have trouble sleeping. Yes, check. I mean, a skilled person could could create their own diagnosis if they wanted to. And and and, and again, this is this affects like twenty percent of the population at any point in time. It's uh, that's not a very satisfactory uh, situation. So uh, yeah, this is this is to be proven. I mean, I agree with you. It's still a hypothesis, but I think it's it it it's a it's a kind of theory that that has a lot of explanatory power. Yeah, thank you for the talk once again. Um, my question is a little bit going back to the it, all of this research is done on the assumption under the assumption of the American English language, right? Um, more or less in the engrams on how we express um, different things on social media. I want well, go yeah, go go into the books, but I'm, I'm talking about like Twitter, for example. Um, do you think there's a possibility that the language constraints that are placed on the way in which we communicate feelings in in Twitter um, either amplify or show are, are the reason for this data? Whereas if we looked at other languages where the expression of feelings might be in different forms, we don't see the same patterns. Okay. I'm I'm thinking mainly at the labeling that you mentioned, where you say the only, basically in English, the only way that you can say I am something is by saying I am a whatever. Right, but but in other languages that might not be the case, and so the labeling factor maybe does not exist or is not shown in the population. So yeah, that's a really tough one because the I mean that's also what culture comes into play. You know, like um, I mean I'm you know I, I, it's something it's something that really struck me. So that there's this there's this game show on Belgian TV and sort of it's Dutch, right? So I'm I'm a Dutch speaker myself, and so he's about my age, and so at one point he uh, but he's also he used to be a rock musician. And I don't know what that song is, like, uh, you know, with the shape of an L on your forehead. Well, the years keep coming and, and uh, you know, what's that song? Um, blink, blink. Uh, yeah, 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 that one. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, I suck at singing. But anyway, yeah, that song. But he said, well, and then he explained, he said, well, the, the, you know, the, the, her fingers in the shape of an L. I said, well, it, you know, it means that, you, you know, she's telling you you're a loser. And then he turns to the camera, the guy turns out, it's one of those moments, right? Because he does a lot of ad lip stuff. He turns to the camera and says, when did we start talking about each other that way? When, when did it become cool to, to, to talk about people in terms of losers and winners? And I, I, and it brought back some memories. Like if, if, if you know, if my mom would hear you say something, oh, that that guy's a, an idiot. There might be a little pat on the back of your head. You know, say, don't talk about people that way. Stop call. It was call, calling names. It was not cool. So the culture made that much more difficult. And so but that's just the culture. That's not even the language. But I can imagine in some languages, it's just much more difficult to express these things. And I don't know what kind of effect that might have. That doesn't mean that people aren't thinking them. But but thinking and the thought and language, I think, are much more intertwined than we think they are. Yeah, I'm happy I'm not the only one that knows segments of that song, actually. But yeah, but I think that the, the, yeah, so in some languages that will be more difficult, for sure. I, I know, the, for example, the Dutch, I'm Belgian, right? But the Dutch, to me, strike me as terribly Polyanish. 
if you complain to the Dutch, they will never complain. The French will reciprocate. There's all oh, the weather is terrible. The French, I think it's fair. They, they will complain with you. Oh, no, everything is terrible. We should have a riot. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the Dutch will say, well, okay, yeah, it rains a little bit, but it was not so. I mean, it rained much more last week. And, you know, that. <laughs> So their culture, I think, is is a little more healthy in trying to keep the temperature down. They even have like all kinds of saying about acting normal. Like they're, they're like they're, sometimes they tell you like act normal. That's crazy enough. So I always find that very insulting when they say that. But the you know act normal for you to tell me how to act. You know, uh, but but it, I, yeah, it would be really interesting to look at these kind of. I mean. It, the other hypotheses I have, like right now, people are being treated for these disorders by going to a therapist and sitting down. That's, that doesn't scale very well. There's a shortage of therapists. There's a, but, but I'm thinking if, if we could all collectively just agree to, for, for example, express these cognitive distortions a little less or push back a little bit when someone says that, perhaps we can sort of collectively have a disproportionate effect on how we all feel. So that... that Perhaps we can tune sort of, perhaps it's a parameter in our culture and a language that we can tune a little bit. So I, I, I could ramble about this for, you know. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, can you speak to avoid this? Okay, I will ask then. Um, yeah, I, I found your research um, very interesting. In fact, one of uh, the Louis students is doing some similar research on this topic. No shit. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, but um, I mean, particularly in this part when you're using the keywords such as uh, diagnose and depression to asseverate that someone is having real depression, I think that Twitter is one of those social media when people just can uh, look for attention and maybe they can lie about his mental state. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the first question is about uh, excluding these individuals. Uh, is there a strategy that you have thought? Uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, looking for or exploring other social media such as Reddit, because in Reddit, usually people tend to ask for more serious advice. Right. But I want to know your opinion about it. Yeah, I mean, th th that's, a, that's an issue. I mean, at the same time, I also think that there's a little bit of sort of identity politics, politics that, have crept, that has crept into this. Like some of the thinking about sort of internalizing disorders and mental health disorders has become sort of a, a question of identity to some people. And uh, I, I don't know how to put this in words without sort of uh, sounding, uh, because I don't want to be flippant about this. But I think there's people that go online say, you know, like, I am someone that has depression. And that becomes part of who they are. You know, they, they, they consider that to be like a, like a, like a feature of themselves. And then they feel a, a responsibility to share that with other people, to inform them about, you know, to reduce the stigma or the social taboo, et cetera. And they become like, almost like spokespersons for their own disorder, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? And it becomes part of a, someone's identity. And so once it, once it takes aspects of this, yeah, you could, you could, it could be that our data are distorted or biased by sort of the higher prevalence of individuals that, 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 that have taken on that moniker and talk about it a lot. But we do exclude in most of our analysis individuals that are, are outliers with respect to how often they use these kind of terms, how often they, they, they make these kind of expressions. I mean, we would do our best. But of course, you cannot. I mean, the, on, the, on the one hand, there's also social stigma. Some people just don't want to talk about this stuff at all. The other thing with depression is that it uh, lowers people's motivation. And so, we, you know, a colleague actually pointed this out. The people that see a doctor to be treated for depression are not those that are the worst afflicted by the depression because extremely depressed individuals struggle to leave their beds. They struggle to actually go to the doctor. So even when you look at sort of official medical records, you will have a very biased sample. That we have that too in social media, I'm sure. But I, I don't know which way that bias points. But what, the best that we can do is just filter it to the best of our ability and make sure that we remove the outliers, etc. But I agree with you there. There could be bias, but but, but again, there could be even more significant biases in the electronic health records. 
Okay, thank you so much. And as I understand, you're using uh, free context grammars to analyze all these different uh, cognitive distortions. Right. So, what about using uh, more complex and for and therefore more real human language grammars, such as, for example, context sensitive in this uh, Chomsky's hierarchy? What about using? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're looking at that as well. I mean, uh, th th there's like an engineering part of this, right? So you, you, you want the detection of a cognitive distortion in language to be as accurate as possible. And then the question is, how do you do that? This lexicon is a very sort of, it's a high precision, but very low recall way of doing this, I think. Uh, but there's all kinds of things that you can do. I mean, ChatGPT does very well in detecting cognitive distortions. You can literally ask it. So my friend posted this tweet. Does that tweet contain a cognitive distortion? You'll get a complete report. So. So it, it is part of the language. A, a large language model like ChatGPT seems to have acquired some somewhat of an understanding of what a cognitive distortion is and how it's manifested in language. So yeah, there could be all kinds of much more sophisticated means of doing this. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Again, this is an this is ongoing research. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, based on the previous question, like, could it be possible to use like epidem epidemiological models to like see like transmission of like depression between like followers or something like this, so you can like solve this problem? So, what is like a prescription, doctor? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we have looked, I mean, I didn't present that, but there, there's another set of slides, and then, of course, that we, we would still be here tomorrow morning, but where we have actually looked at uh, homophily and um, uh, of, of uh, mood and cognitive distortions in social networks, and uh, that does seem to point out that people do connect and cluster on the basis of their language use and their, their, their emotional state, meaning that people who are not very happy seem to connect more frequently than people aren't happy as well. So you've got sort of a, like two, sort of a, a, a bimodal distribution. Um, so yeah, these networks are very assortative, meaning that pe like people connect to like people. And that, um, and that could be the case for men these mental health disorders. But of course that would be even worse because now you're online, you have all of these algorithms kind of conspiring against your mental health then you start to get connected to people who are very outspoken about these things and before you know it you've got a little bit of a sort of a uh, an information bubble enclosing you but it's not an information bubble about you know whether you know president obama is a, a blood drinking vampire from space or something like that but but a group of people that have very strong beliefs about their their, their mental health and you know so yeah it's perfectly possible well, there's also a lot of misinformation being spread about uh, online about mental health disorders, uh, uh, about brain science as well. I mean, uh, just, uh, I, I mean, I mean, I received a link from someone from some, some Hollywood doctor that claimed that you know the brains of men and women are so different that that, that it's essentially two different species, which just uh, utterly completely false. But 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 it's been going rounds on on Instagram apparently. Uh, yeah, so you have all of that in it, it. Yeah, it's it's a pretty toxic brew. <laughs> um, yeah, I also had a question, and that uh, you just mentioned it a little bit. But so up till now, you only talked about Twitter. But I would say that Twitter is nowadays less and less used, maybe for younger generation. So how would you extrapolate it to different social media? By getting their data, uh, that's a that's a great idea. We ha I have someone right now harvesting TikTok data, and uh, we we'll work with YouTube and Reddit as well. So there's a lot of, I mean, of course, that there's like uh, specifics related to every single platform. Yeah. But if it's a social media platform, they, they all have certain features in common. So, but I agree with you. There could be some some of these could be worse than others, and I think that the um, I, I think these some of these comparisons have been made, and particularly Instagram. Even, you know, the research department at Instagram, I think actually it leaked, made a presentation about how devastating to the mental health, especially young women, Instagram could be. And so it seems like Instagram was very much aware of the uh, the effect that their platform was having on the me mental health of, it, of its, even Facebook knew it, yeah. And and is it also less, less based on language then, for instance, because Twitter is... Yeah. Just tweets, yeah, right? That's just, yeah, exactly. So you would expect, the, 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 yeah, it would be easier to measure in the language, but we're right now also working on videos. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I, I would say this though, even on TikTok, a, a lot of the actual content, the meaningful content is still t text or words. It's still verbal. I mean, I, I mean, you've got like three or four people doing like a cute dance. Obviously, that doesn't mean much, but 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 there's like substantive material on TikTok and on Instagram, and uh, that's not just uh, that, that's there's a lot of text still, and the hashtags, etc. Yeah, but th these are all very interesting questions to to ask. But in, but in general, I think and, and I, I kind of agree with Jared Lenny on this that if it's social media, that means it it has certain features. It has these algorithms that promote engagement. It has the timelines. It has the likes or the little hearts. It has all of these sort of metrics of social approval, etc. And I, I think you could. It's a constellation of features that I think may be very damaging to people's mental health, especially in the case of overuse. And I, we don't know whether that overuse is the symptom. Of the mental health disorder or whether it's uh, a cause but since these environments are being used by uh, young people all over the world i mean from the age of 13 to you know d down to the grave you know, so to speak uh I and mean, it's across the lifespan it's something that we should be worried about yeah it's something that i'm worried about at least yeah. not telling you to worry <laughs> Also, I, I just detect a slight accent there, and I want to make make sure that you don't misinterpret my comments on the Dutch, <laughs> because I, you know, whom I like a lot. So. Yeah. So I was just wondering when you you introduce the balance, right, for uh, positive and negative sentiments. When yes. There is the spike. I mean, the first slide you show that uh, women are more inclined to depression. Yes. Then you have the data for both men and women. Yes. Right. So did you try to do the same plot? Yes. Break it down by women. Yeah. So the effect that I showed, we did separate it from men and women and uh, we found very similar effects. What about the, there was the almost age and gender, the, the age, age distribution? Yeah, we didn't have that data. The problem with the Twitter data is that we almost have no demographics. So right now we're actually working the way the other way around. So we're, we have a very large survey of all incoming freshmen at IU. They take a survey that is, and there's a battery of mental health screenings, and then we ask them to donate to us their social media okay. history. And so that way we do have the demographics and the age and the educational level, et cetera. But purely from the Twitter data, it was not possible to figure that out. But I agree with you that that could be a really important determinant of some of these data. Yes. Yeah. Right. Was the average was the average of all the users, or was just single users? Oh, uh -huh. of the, 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 the those emotional timelines. That, yes. was, that was by cohort. That was not for individual users. Okay. I did show some timelines for individual users, but there, of course, you lose a lot of power. Okay. So I mean, it was an average. So. Yeah, so it's not strictly speaking individual timelines. Yeah, that's a that's a complication indeed. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I see. Thank yeah, you. It's, yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy you noticed because that that, that is a limitation. To, you know, I mean, people are a down won't post. They'll post less, and so it's a little bit of you just don't know. You got a gap in your measurement, so that's why I think we also need to include. Uh, uh, we also need to include uh, what you call it uh, wearables, etc. But again, that that doesn't yield any introspective data, which is what we need here. So that's social media, honestly, I, uh, even though I think it's really, really bad for humanity, it's great for data scientists. So. Yeah. And, and with this, we end <laughs> our discussion. Uh, let's thank Johan. Thank and uh, well done, well done. We can continue the discussion in the coffee break. See you in half an hour. <laughs>